President Obama continuing his European tour today in Strasbourg, which I keep forgetting is in France. He's there for a big NATO meeting at which he has launched stage three of his big Afghanistan war plan sales pitch. Stage one was to sell it to Capitol Hill, sell it to American politicians. With only minor opposition brewing on both the left and the right in Washington, stage one, I think we have to consider to be passed. Stage two, sell it to the American public. Recent polling on Afghanistan shows the jury definitely still out in terms of public opinion on that. So stage two, still undecided. Stage three, though, is selling it abroad, selling it to NATO, to our allies, to try to make them believe that it is a better idea to join us in Afghanistan now than it was when George Bush was still in office. So far, stage three of the sales pitch is looking pretty good. French President Nicolas Sarkozy emerged from talks with Obama today, saying the French, quote, totally endorse and support President Obama's new Afghanistan strategy. He's promising to send more police trainers and civilian aid to Afghanistan. And he even promised, at least theoretically at least, that France would take in a prisoner from Guantanamo. After all the praise for the new Afghanistan war plan, Sarkozy cut loose and said what he thinks about the American president himself. I trust him. I don't need guarantees. I trust him. I trust his word. I trust his intelligence. In other words, whatever this man is selling, the French are buying. German Chancellor Angela Merkel also met with President Obama today and also promised to help out more in Afghanistan, calling Mr. Obama's new approach to the war, quote, gratifying. But even as the president's plan is being successfully sold to our allies, there are, of course, still big questions about whether... It's a good idea. Questions that still haven't thoroughly been answered. The president says his goal is to defeat the Taliban in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. He says he wants to deny al-Qaeda safe havens in either country, which sounds like the kind of thing everyone would agree on. No safe havens for terrorists, right? But maybe that's a little simple. Simple in a way that we can't really afford to walk away from. As Matthew Iglesias wrote this week at Think Progress, quote, Recall that key action in the 9-11 plot took place not just in Afghanistan, but in Hamburg, Germany. And the best governance initiative in history is not going to make Afghanistan as orderly and prosperous as Germany. You know, good point. Even as the alliance building presidential sales pitch proceeds better than anyone could have predicted, might we be asking the wrong big picture questions about what we are doing in Afghanistan in the first place? Joining us now is Andrew Exum. He's a fellow with the Center for a New American Security, and he's author of the book, This Man's Army, A Soldier's Story from the Front Lines of the War on Terror. Mr. Exum, thank you very much for coming on the show tonight. Thanks for having me. In an article this week, I'm going to quote you to yourself. You ready? Ready. E even if we succeed in spreading effective governance to southern Afghanistan and western Pakistan, are we then prepared to go wherever the transnational terror groups relocate? Are we prepared to clear out the Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon or provide governance to the Horn of Africa? The new Obama plan is a dangerous precedent. If the reason we're staying in Afghanistan is to, to deny al-Qaeda the use of safe havens, where are we going next? Is it your main concern that there are too many safe havens to eliminate them all? Well, first off, I have to say that the Obama plan, if it's designed to achieve the concrete political objectives of shutting down these safe havens that are on this Pashtun belt that straddles Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's a pretty good plan. I think that a lot of the lines of operation that come in, they're, they're non-kinetic lines of operation. We've decided that you can't just kill your way out of these wars, that you have to improve governance, that you have to improve economic development, you have to provide essential services to the population. But as far as a precedent, it is pretty worrying, right? Because if, if we've got this one safe haven straddling Afghanistan and Pakistan, then what do we do if another safe haven crops up in the Horn of Africa? Or, uh, or do we then, you know, how direct a role do we take in Lebanon with the Palestinian refugees? camps. So I think that's a question going forward, and it's one I'd be asking. So you're essentially saying that we could do it in Afghanistan and Pakistan. It would be incredibly resource intensive. It would take a long time, but we could, but we, we could accomplish it through the means that the president has proposed. The question is whether we're then going to take on the responsibility of doing it everywhere. Yeah, well, I'm not even sure about that. Uh, I'm not even sure about that first proposition, because what we're essentially doing is we're acting out a counterinsurgency strategy as a third party. And the trick about doing that is that really success, political success, depends upon the other government. So without any type of political reconciliation from the Afghans or any type of, uh, of improved governance from Islamabad, we're going to have trouble acting out the, uh, the strategy that we're proposing. Well, it doesn't seem like the <clears throat> governance issues in Afghanistan or Pakistan are going to 
resolve anytime soon, even though I'm an eternal optimist and I hope that they sometime, sometime could. It just seems like it's unlikely that within the time frame that Americans are willing to stay committed to that region, we're going to see enough transformational change, not only in the capital cities of those countries, but in terms of local governance to work effectively with our big proposal. I, that's, the, that's the reason that I um, am having, I still have big questions about this plan, even though I understand the logic of it. It just seems to me like the governance thing has to happen contemporaneously with our investment, and I don't believe that it will. Yeah, I mean, I think your, your concerns are valid. I think our first priority in Afghanistan is to protect the population. That's something that we haven't done a really good job of since 2001 and 2002. And quite honestly, we haven't had the resources to do it. So I'd say that's the first priority. But the second priority, you're exactly right, is working on, I mean, quite honestly, I think Afghanistan was rated by Transparency International as the 176th most corrupt nation in the world uh, out of 180 countries. Uh, so corruption is a really big issue in Afghanistan. In the same way, trying to get the government in Islamabad across the border to extend control into the federally administrated tribal areas and to the northwest frontier province, these are really tricky issues. In Afghanistan, we've got a lot more leverage than we do in Afghanistan, or in Pakistan, rather, but uh, it's still going to be quite tricky. One of the things that, um, one of the conclusions that jerks like me jump to all the time, people who haven't ever been in the military like you have and haven't actually worked at this stuff on the ground, one of the conclusions that we jump to is the idea that expanding the military footprint in Afghanistan might actually be counterproductive in terms of the goal just of keeping the population safe, that our la a large occupying presence for a very long time might instigate more of the Taliban elements, more of the extremist elements might support their side of things in a way that ultimately makes the population less safe rather than more safe, even though we've got more guys there. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's a valid concern. I think, in, I think you have to take things in a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, I, you know, having said that, a lot of international aid organizations have the exact fear that you do. Actually, their fear is that the situation for the population in Afghanistan is going to worsen once we get into the fighting season, especially with this influx of new troops. Having said that, in, in the specific case of Afghanistan, I believe more troops are probably the wise, uh, wise decision, at least in the short term, because right now we really have an obligation to protect the population. That's something we haven't done a good job of over the past five years. In Pakistan, on the other side of the border, however, a direct influx of American troops would probably be a very bad idea. So in the same way that every insurgency is sui generis. They all arrive from a very specific social, political, cultural milieu. And uh, in Afghanistan, more troops might be a good decision. In Pakistan, direct American action is probably a bad decision. It's a tricky calculus. It's got to play out. I commend you for raising the issue this week. I think the difficult, counterintuitive issue this week, that safe havens might be a bad sort of goal, might be a bad proposal uh, for American action moving forward, especially thinking beyond Afghanistan and Pakistan with all the other places that extremist groups that might conceivably threaten us operate. I wonder if you think there's a better alternative, if there's something other than denying terrorist groups safe havens that would be a better organizing principle for moving forward. Yeah, here's the trouble, because we've been presented with kind of this dichotomy before the review. We had either counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. Uh, if we pursue a counterinsurgency strategy, that's, uh, that's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, it's going to cost a lot of resources, and I'm not just talking about financial resources or materiel. I'm also talking about a lot of casualties, both from our perspective and also on behalf of our NATO allies and also Afghan civilians, keep in mind. Um, so it's going to be a really intensive, and, uh, and it's going to be a very costly exercise. On the other hand, uh, the, the really bad news is that I think a really strict solely kinetic, that is, just trying to kill our way out of this solution, a solely kinetic counter-terror uh, strategy, I think that would fail miserably, especially in Pakistan. I think, uh, I think that would be the bad approach. Uh, having said that, I think what you, know, what, you, what you heard from the president last week is he talked a lot about metrics, ways to measure success or ways to measure failure, as it were. And I think that's going to be something that everyone's going to be looking for in the next 12 months. Just a quick tip to your viewers. Violence is going to be a really bad metric over the next 12 months. Violence is probably going to increase. But if we're having the same level of violence today that we do, uh, or rather a year from now, that we do today, okay, that's reason to worry. I think we can expect an uptick of violence, but whether or not we're able to establish security is, uh, is really the key question going forward a year from now. Is there a good metric to keep an eye on in the short term over the next couple of months? You know, it's interesting. One of the units in eastern Afghanistan, one of the metrics they use is the variety of vegetables available in the local markets because that tells them who's been growing poppy and uh, to what degree are farmers diversifying their crops. So we're going to have to get pretty 
pretty uh, pretty creative with our metrics. In Vietnam, the Marines use rice production instead of body count. Uh, I'm not really sure what the best metric is for Afghanistan yet, but I'll get you an answer on it. I am totally deploying to the farmer's markets to count the vegetables. <laughs> Andrew Exum, fellow at the Center for New American Security, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's really good to get your perspective. Sure, thanks. Yeah.